Let's talk about a different set of judges. These are the European Union judges who five years ago told EU citizens that they have the right to ask for information deemed to be, and I'm quoting, inaccurate, inadequate, irrelevant or excessive to be removed from searches on internet search engines, especially Google. Well, the law is known as the right to be forgotten and those same judges have backed Google today saying that this right to be forgotten is only enforceable in Europe and not globally. What does that say then about the right to be forgotten and what does it mean. I've been speaking to Emily Taylor, who's from Oxford Information Labs, an associate fellow at the think tank Chatham House. The right to be forgotten. You know, we, we all do things in our past that we'd rather not be reminded of. And it's a, an ability for people to ask Google to delist or take away the links to very historical stories about themselves. Now, this came from a complaint uh, from the French privacy watchdog and they wanted Google to extend that delisting all the way through the world and what the court has said here is no it should only apply in Europe and also it has to be held in balance privacy isn't an absolute right you also have to balance it against other very important rights such as the right to freedom of expression and the right to seek and impart information. So if we could all gloss over everything in our past, we would feel that our privacy was protected, but others wouldn't know very important things about us. So, so it's a question of getting the balance right. Yeah. Now, this all comes, I think, from an original case where somebody had debts, they were still talked about, There's, the story was still there about his indebtedness on the internet, but he paid them off and he thought it was unfair that every time you searched for his name, you got this thing about him owing money. Yes. Now, is this decision saying that the basis of the right to be forgotten is wrong or simply saying that you can't extend the jurisdiction beyond the European Court of Justice border areas? The, this judgment is confirming the earlier case law saying that there is a right to be forgotten so we can still ask Google to delist things. However, it's just going to apply within Europe. Now, with a global internet, there are lots of questions about how that exactly works. You know, because you can hide your location, you can access things by through virtual private networks, for example, and pretend you're outside Europe and still access the information. And it really shows the, the, the mismatch between this global network and national and regional laws which do assert themselves. So it doesn't make the law meaningless, but it certainly weakens it, doesn't it? Because as you say, you could just be somewhere else or you could pretend you're somewhere else and then you can access information that you can't access if you're actually in Europe. It weakens it in one way. In another way, I think it's a very sensible approach because you can well imagine that it could be very abused if it was it was applying globally. You could imagine that people in other regimes outside of Europe would use it to delist stories that were embarrassing to the regime or, or stories that um, that would embarrass, uh, you know, politicians or public figures in some way. And this is a European law. Why should it apply globally? In a way, this is showing that, you know, after the famous GDPR, the data protection rules that apply in Europe, they have a, an extra, you know, extra territorial effect. They, they apply outside of Europe. This is perhaps the court beginning to start to row back from that very aggressive stance. But it does mean that this idea of privacy is still very difficult to get hold of, isn't it? That we're worried about privacy, we give away so much of our information, we then get nervous because we get bombarded with adverts for things that we don't really want and all of that. Mm. We just don't know where this technology is taking us. No, we don't. And the technology affects our privacy in ways that I think we're only beginning to understand. There's a huge difference between what people say they're worried about and what they do, what we all do online, services such as Google, Facebook, the popular platforms are routinely tracking and profiling us in order to show us relevant advertising. Now, there are occasions as the, you know, the first case that established the right to be forgotten, where a, a somebody who's a very private individual has got a historical debt thing, and that's just haunting them through search results. But there are many other occasions where it's much more finely balanced. Now, for people in the public eye, 
isn't it necessary for the public to know things about their past that could have an effect on what they're doing now in the present? I would suggest, Emily, this isn't the last time the lawyers will have a go at this. I don't think so. I think it's a very difficult issue. You know, privacy is not an absolute right. There are lots of um, scenarios where privacy has to give way, for example, if there's a criminal investigation. And it also has to be held in balance with very important freedoms like the freedom of expression and the freedom to impart information and receive it. That's Emily Taylor. She's chief executive of Oxford Information Labs.